Shadia Rayfish here, board certified surgeon, chief of specialty and part owner of True Care for Pets, a 24-7 specialty and emergency hospital located in Studio City, Los Angeles, California. Today we are going to go into more detail regarding clients who have financial limitations and if anybody's ever owned a pet or currently own a pet, you know what this is like. An unexpected emergency occurs to your dog or cat, and now you are in the veterinary hospital three o'clock in the morning with an enormous bill with all the stuff they want to do to your pet. So we're going to dive into that today. I want to thank my surgery technicians, Lindsay and Jay. They're joining us today with this conversation. What's up, guys? Hi. So we're going to we're going to kind of dive into from from my perspective as a veterinarian and their perspective as veterinary technicians and pet owners what it's like to deal with a scenario where you want to do everything you can for your pet but financially it's it's tight and what are what what can you do to to manage that because obviously you want to do what what's right but at the same time you've got to be realistic within your own financial constraints as far as what you reasonably and realistically can do for your pet without sacrificing your own personal uh, personal needs, financially speaking. And so I think maybe the first topic we should dive into is how big of a problem is this? How often do we see it? Secondly, what can you do as an owner to try and gain access to more funds? And third, is it all or nothing? Do you have to do everything your vet recommends? And if you can't afford it, it's too bad. Or, or are there are there other ways to sort of find a, a good a good middle ground? And so let's start off with how often is this problem? How often do you guys see this issue with pet owners where we hand them an invoice, whether it's for a few hundred dollars or whether it's seven to ten thousand dollars for some of our more sick patients who need critical care and emergency surgery? How often is this an issue? Pretty often, ten times a day. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And this is daytime and nighttime, twenty four seven. We have this. We we deal with this on this on the veterinary side. And all ranges of estimates, from you know, relatively in our eyes, cheap estimates, all the way up to ten thousand dollar estimates. We run into these issues, and I think part of the problem is, is that people care so much about their pets, they want to do everything, and they have trouble admitting to us when they can't afford something. So they will drag us along for a while, they'll prolong treatment, um, they'll call every relative they have, they'll stand on the street corner and can't handle. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think just being up front with us, like I, I appreciate a lot more when owners, I hand them you know, a plan for treatment with costs and they tell me, I don't have this. I In my bank account right now, I have you know, this much money and there's no way I can afford this, then we can move forward knowing what the limitations are instead of, you know, dancing along, <laughs> flirting around, sure. signing the estimate, sure. but never really doing it. Or they sign an estimate that they can't pay, which happens. Mm-hmm. Too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, uh, and we'll, we'll dive into some other options that pet owners have that they can look into to help them financially. But this is definitely a common a common ordeal. And it's unfortunate to have to tie in the finances to the medicine because as a doctor and as veterinary technicians, we all want to recommend what's best for the pet and ignore the finances because we know what's right. We know what we have to do to make this pet better. And unfortunately, we have to balance out the finances as well, which ends up muddying the waters from a standpoint of compassion and from the standpoint of being able to carry out the ideal plan that the doctor wants to carry out for this particular patient. Yeah, and I think a lot of owners, I mean, we hear this every day, tell us that all we care about is the money. You know, we hear that frequently, and it's it's hard because it's like, well, you know, we have to power this building. We have to put the people yeah, in this we building. We can't service you if we're not getting paid. We <laughs> yeah, can't here. very little of that money that they pay is genuine profit. You know, it's going to paying for all the consumable items that are used on that case, whether it's a syringe or a catheter or medications, to pay the salaries of the receptionists, the, you know, kennel attendants, the technicians, the doctors, and then, you know whatever's left over, but most of the time we barely break even on a lot of these cases, but people still have this perception that all we're, we're in it for is the money. And, you know, we, we hear that almost every day. We heard that yesterday. And it's interesting because if you end up going to get your car fixed at a mechanic, 
they're not going to do anything until you pay their bill. Yeah. I mean, that's expected. And you would never tell your mechanic, oh, all you care about is the money. You don't care about my car or that I can't get to work. Well, and you don't see moms in markets with like three kids trying to buy a gallon of milk and they only have 50 cents and the milk's $2 and be like, you don't want to feed my kids. Like you don't. Right. <laughs> you don't care about my kids. You want <laughs> you know, some of this milk for 50 cents. Yeah. But no, we hear that all the time and it's, it's hard because we do as much as we can but people don't realize the toll that that takes on all the staff and um, why we have such high turnover rates, why we have such high suicide rates and things like that. A lot of it comes down to this. Sure. Compassion fatigue. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll dive into this in more detail on other podcasts as well regarding sort of the the – environment or the culture surrounding the surrounding the veterinary profession that's a whole nother discussion on its own as to why this this kind of negative stuff occurs on the veterinary side but clearly you can at least based on the first problem we're trying to tackle here how common is is financial limitations with pet owners well it's very common and the the clients that we tend to focus more on are not the ones that have money in the bank that are really really where money is no object and they've got the funds and they'll spend whatever on their pet. It's the clients who are the majority of clients who want the best for their pet and genuinely don't have the funds. And some of those will bring it full circle into sort of a negative attitude where all we care about is the money, which of course is not, is not true. We do have to care about the money to a certain degree for all the overhead costs. In a hospital like this where we are heading towards 100 employees, 24-7 powered building, CAT scan, x-ray machines, blood machines, the technical staff, all the implants we use, all the equipment we use, all that stuff the rent, everything plays a role in the cost of the hospital. And so we need to have, we need to care about money. Otherwise that's bad business. And what gives a veterinary hospital that goes out of business because they could, kept giving services away and couldn't pay the bills. So financial limitations, big problem. And so that'll bring us then to our second topic, which is what can pet owners do about it? What are other options that pet owners have? Here you are, you have your dog in the room, with the veterinarian, you're looking at an enormous estimate, whether it be a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, and you're wondering, what else can I do? I can't afford this. What are options? Well, I wish people would take it back way before this point and invest in pet insurance. I really do. I, I think that pet insurance got a bad rap when it first came out because it had, there was one company and they could take advantage of people. But now pet insurance is a legitimate thing. There's lots of companies that do a lot of good work and it's worth the 30 to $60 a month to then be in the room with the veterinarian and know you can afford something. And I think that takes a huge weight off people's shoulders. So the first day you decide to get a pet, you should sign up for pet insurance. I really encourage people. Um, different companies have different programs. Like True Panion gives you a one-month free trial, I think. Um, and if your pet gets sick in that first month that you didn't even pay anything, they still cover it. Um, so really invest in pet insurance if you can beforehand. Even um, just plain accident insurance. You don't need the gold platinum, you know, <laughs> the highest priced plan that they have, but you can get a really low plan that covers illness and accident only and no preventative care. And that's better than nothing. Um, and I have it for two of my dogs. I pay every month for it and I work in a veterinary hospital and as such get a large discount, but I still invest in it and that should say something to people. You also have Trupanion? No, I actually have pet plan mm -hmm. uh, because Trupanion is everything. Their emergency illness and preventative medicine and working in a veterinary hospital, I only wanted emergency coverage. So my dog breaks its leg, um, he has a, a herniated disc, uh, really big invoices that even with a discount I couldn't afford on my salary, I wanted to know we're, we're taken care of. Uh, so that would be the first line of defense, I think, is investing in pet insurance. It's really worth it. You could shop around. There's five different really reputable companies. We can link those in the description below um, for you to check out uh, if you're interested. Then if you're in the exam room and you're presented with a huge estimate that you can't afford, I think the first step is to admit that. I just don't have the finances to do this. What are my options? Because we're always willing to work with you. We're Provide. even more willing to work yeah. with you if you're honest with us, I feel like. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. 
Um, so there's different financing options available to owners. Um, the big, big one in the industry is called Care Credit. It's the same thing you use at your dentist's office or your plastic surgeon to get your lip injections, um, <laughs> anything like that. You can apply for that at home even before you go to the vet. Um, some people, I personally want to know what I have available to me before I go. So if I'm going to the dentist for like a toothache and I know I'm going to end up with a big bill, I'll apply for care credit at home and see what I get approved for. But you can do it in the office as well. Um, then there's a couple other minor companies. One we use here is Scratch Pay. And both of those offer usually 12 months no interest payments. Uh, but after that, they really come after you with a really high percentage rate. I think it's like 32%. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So then you have to either pay it or transfer it to another card. Right. You're going to be smart about it. So I assume with these different financial options, it kind of depends on where you're at with your own financial situation, which one will fit better? Yeah, and I mean, they tend to be a little more lenient than normal credit cards. So people who feel like, oh, I'm not going to get approved for anything, I have really bad credit, should still apply for care credit and scratch pay because they tend to offer a little bit more than you would expect. Even if it is only a portion of the bill that you get approved for, at least you know you can afford that much of it. So, so, so just like, so to recap this and where we're at so far, as far as what other options you have, if you can't really afford the estimate that your veterinarian wants you to approve is first of all, preemptively taking care of this, which is, which is basically two things, pet insurance and also following preventive medical measures with your family veterinarian. The more prevention you can instill in your pet's life in the hopes of preventing foreseeable diseases in the future, the less likely chance you have of those problems occurring. So if you have your on your pet, for example, on glucosamine supplements for their joints to try and minimize arthritis development, well then maybe you won't need a surgery five years later or some kind of intense acupuncture or physical therapy or something later on if you followed your veterinarian's recommendations. So if you preemptively try to prevent diseases from occurring by following your family veterinarian's recommendations, and you purchase pet health insurance, these are both ways you can try and minimize diseases from either occurring in the future or when surprises do occur, hopefully financially you'll be ready to tackle them and you can do whatever needs to be done. And then second to that is going to be payment options. So, so everybody kind of goes towards the idea of, oh, they'll give me a discount, they'll give me a discount, I'll ask for a discount, which, which can happen. We, we do have policies in place for those special circumstances, but they are few and far between. Care credit and scratch pay are two such financial options that you may have at, at your disposal from your veterinary office. These companies do tend to make it where you can apply easily and quickly and get a response fairly fairly quick because these companies do recognize that you're usually going to pay a high bill due to an unexpected emergency, nothing that you were planning on having to deal with. And so you're waiting literally in the veterinary office to make a decision financially to approve your veterinarian's estimate. And these companies are usually aware of that and will work quickly to try and get you whatever funds they can get you. But of course, they are based on credit scores. So the, these, these things don't work for everybody and not everybody wants to apply for them, but it is an option. And then I also want to add to, we're in the age of the internet now, right? So GoFundMe pages or other fundraising techniques. What do you guys, what do you guys know about, about those two options? Do clients use them a lot? Are they successful? What have you seen done as far as raising money outside the veterinary office? I mean, we've seen it work and we've seen it not work. Um, with the GoFundMe, for instance, we had a client here that was able to raise more than what he needed for the surgery. About three days or so. Yeah, but I think that really depends on how up you are with your social media, how many followers do you have, things like that is going to be really related to how much money you raise. I think that for most owners, GoFundMe's or, you know, Facebook campaigns or things like that are pretty not successful. Um, I think you're more likely to find help by reaching out to various rescue organizations um, that may be able to help you financially. They may have a deal with a certain veterinarian. If you go there, they can um, 
um, pay part of your bill. Um, I've also seen people that will, and this goes back to one of our other podcasts where we talked about choosing a veterinarian. Um, you can look online and there are low cost veterinarians out there and they will advertise that. Um, and for instance, there's one not far from us in Burbank called Thrive and it's a new hospital, but their whole thing is being low cost for owners. And if you know that you have financial limitations, you may want to start out at a low cost vet where you know that you may be able to afford more than the, you know, the really nice vet on, you know, the fancy street in the middle of the town or whatever. Um, there's also low cost surgery centers. There's, um, free spay neuter resources, free vaccine resources. So if you're someone with limited funds and you're like, I need to do all this preventative care, which may be vaccines. So my dog doesn't get parvo and have a $2,000 bill. Um, you can find those things for free if you put some work into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so what do you guys do? You, you, you both own multiple pets mm-hmm. and they of course run into problems the way any other pet would run into problems with. Sometimes they require minimal medical care, sometimes major surgeries. So what do you guys do individually to try and mitigate the costs for an unexpected veterinary emergency visit? I have care credit. I applied for care credit. Um, and I got approved. You get approved instantly, and I was able to use it. So I'm always going to have that on hand now, no matter what. I don't have pet insurance, unfortunately. So it's never too late. It is never too it's late. Never too late. <laughs> never too late. Um, I I try to keep some money aside for my pets. Um, I just lost one of my pets who, with my discounts from all the different veterinarians we went to. We went through chemotherapy, went through radiation, surgery, physical therapy. With my discounts, I spent about $6,000 on her. Um, And that was money that I had had set aside, so now I'm kind of empty. But if anything else came up, I would have to use my care credit or a credit card because your everyday person doesn't have thousands of dollars sitting and waiting for, for your animal. To yeah. <laughs> and I think that you'll hear really cynical people say, well, if you can't afford it, you shouldn't own an animal. And I don't agree with that. You know, if you can afford their basic needs, their food, their water, you can give them love, you can provide them basic veterinary care, and maybe you can afford pet insurance, then it's, there's nothing really wrong with owning a pet, but being prepared, how am I going to handle an emergency situation? And I think people don't prepare for that. They just assume it's not going to happen to them. I also think that breed research goes into that too, because there's certain breeds that you know that you're going to have to treat certain conditions for, and people either ignore it, they don't do their research, or they think, oh, it's not going to happen to me. Like bulldogs. Bulldogs. <laughs> they can't breathe. <laughs> it's a bad place for California for a bulldog. Yeah. Shepherds are going to get dysplasia. Like yeah. exactly what you need to account for. Yeah. Yeah. Just things to, if you know you can't handle it, maybe you should look at other breeds. Or adopt a mixed breed from a shelter. We love mutts. Yay, mutts. Great. Yeah, and I, any, any one of my friends that, 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 that are looking into getting a, a dog or a cat, I tell them that they can save three to $5,000, put it aside for an emergency, like a real emergency, and then we at least have those funds on hand. But these other methods that we're talking about today are also incredibly helpful to try and get yourself prepared for an unexpected disaster, medical disaster that, that can occur any time in the future. And this is regardless of what your previous experience has been. I have pet owners that come to me and, you know, they're on their fourth or fifth dog and now their dog is paralyzed and it's the same breed they've always owned for the past 20 years. And they're like, I never had this problem with other pets. Well, there you go. Your previous experiences do not dictate the future experiences of your current pet. It's just, there's no logic there with that. So always be prepared with, with regards to trying to have finances aside pet insurance, you've got these financial options as well, and of course, the problem all begins with or can be solved with following your initial veterinarian's examination and preventative medicine, vaccinations, heartworm, flea and tick, keeping the joints healthy, keeping the weight off your pet, all those things play a huge role in saving yourself not only financial troubles in the future, but also medical issues in the future. And then finally, we want to talk about our third topic, which is going to be, what can you do to meet your vet halfway? So they, they give you a $5,000 estimate to do some stuff with your pet that they think is best. And you're like, as much as I'd love to do that, doc, I just don't have the funds for it. 
am I, am I screwed? Am I in trouble here? Do I have to just put my dog down? And the truth is in the majority of cases, there's, there's usually a plan B. Now, whether that plan B is ideal or not is a different story. That depends on your veterinarian and your personal case. But there are there have been times where I've had pet owners that say, Doc, I can't afford this. What else can I do? And I usually have an answer. I mean, it's not always do this or put your pet to sleep or do this or go elsewhere. There are other options that, again, are less, less than ideal that you can look into with your family veterinarian because at the end of the day, you are – you're, you are your vet's office. It's the middle of the night. You have an emergency. You didn't listen to this podcast by then, so you didn't do the preventative stuff. You didn't get health, <laughs> health insurance. You didn't do all the stuff that we told you to do. And so now you're there, and you have to deal with it. And all those other advice we're giving you is fantastic, but not for 3 o'clock in the morning when you've got all these other things going on in your personal life, and, and, and you've got to – you got to make a big decision. And so ask your veterinarian for other options. There usually are. It depends on the scenario. But I can usually come up with something that with, with considerable risk involved, depending on the case, that you can do to try and help your pet out. Whether it's just some basic hospitalization or some medications or referral to your family veterinarian so, because they can do certain therapies that we don't offer here because they're not ideal, but they may help your pet. There's ways of, of working around this. And I'm not saying at all that, that this is for every scenario. If your dog ate a towel and is throwing up from the towel and they're getting sicker and sicker, intestinal surgery is your only option. There's nothing else really you can do in the majority of those cases. If your dog is paralyzed and has no movement, no feeling in their legs, it's very unlikely that medications are going to help that. You probably need an emergency MRI and spine surgery. But for the majority of cases, especially ones that see general practitioners or other specialists or emergency doctors, there may be other options. And so if you're not convinced that your veterinarian is giving you all the options or you're not willing to give up on your pet just yet because of financial reasons, well, feel free to seek a second opinion and get get some more ideas because that can be the kind of thing that, although less ideal, at least give you gives you some security in knowing you're trying and gives your pet a chance. Despite despite the fact that you can't do the ideal, you still give your pet a chance. You feel like you're doing something for for uh, for him or her. So to recap, financial troubles are of course commonplace. Everybody's got financial issues. The best method is prevention. Try and be prepared for any and all emergencies in the future. And if you are stuck at the veterinary office with an emergency in the middle of the night, you've got some different payment options, some financial options that you can consider, some more creative internet-based options that you can consider. And of course, worst case scenario, you can potentially have a, a plan B because plan A just is not going to fit into your life considering the reality of the situation. So I hope this podcast helped you guys out. Let us know if we miss anything or if there are any other ideas that you have tried in the past that have worked. We'll be happy to pass that information along. Thank you so much for listening. This is Dr. Dr. Shadia Rafich, board certified surgeon, chief of specialty, and part owner of True Care for Pets, Studio City, Los Angeles, California, 24 7 emergency specialty hospital. Please follow me on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. We look forward to any inquiries or questions you may have. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.